friendly conductor. This station building was modelled on Victoria Station in Manchester. The traces of the British colonial rulers are everywhere. The British ruled between 1796 and 1948. Things were different back then. There are many problems we have. The drivers and guards problems there. In time, they are not into the for their jobs. And other other ways, the workshop people also uh, not working at time. Not they are doing their work properly. We're in luck. Our train bound for Badula is waiting already. We set off at half past eight. We're about to go on a train journey that's been described as one of the most picturesque in Asia. It will take us from Colombo to Ella in the Highlands via Kandy, a journey of around 270 kilometers. A special trip on special tracks. It was the island's first railway route, and it's still known as Mainline. The first 54 kilometer stretch to Ambapusa is celebrating its 150th birthday this year. Maybe that's where this train journey gets its charm and atmosphere. It's a train journey that's always been significant to the people of Sri Lanka. Originally, it was for transport of goods, but they had a minimum passenger carriages as well. Very few passengers traveled, but of course, with the building of the railways, very many in upcountry areas, they always like to travel by train to go and see the sea, sea beach, first time in life for them to go and see the sea beach, they travel by train to Colombo. We crossed the Kalani, one of Sri Lanka's largest rivers, and leave Colombo behind. The entire trip costs between one euro fifty in third class and eight euros in first class. Sri Lankans are very proud of their railway. Because it's so comfortable, it's the schedule time so it goes. Because of that, I travel in this train. As I'm traveling alone, and it's quite safe for me. I've taken the train ever since I was little. It feels good. You can breathe fresh air and see many things out the window, such as mountains, rivers, and lakes. I like that. The train is better than the bus. You feel freer. And the bus costs around twice as much. There's even a television in first class. Those who don't like that can travel in third class for less money and, with a little bit of luck, experience some live music.
The musician, Lushanta, is actually a teacher, but it's often the case in Sri Lanka that young, well-educated people don't find a suitable job. Dear God, please help me. Please, please help us. Please uh, make us our country prosperous. Our country is very poor, you see. So extend your benign, extend your, um, I mean, uh, help, assistance to develop our country. That is the, that is the meaning of the song. Sri Lanka is classed as a developing country. Many people live by agriculture. Often 50 euros a month must suffice for an entire family. That's not a lot here either. 20% of the children are malnourished. The gaps between town and country, rich and poor, are huge. Third class is correspondingly crowded. Some passengers aren't happy about the status quo at all. We want to know what it's like in first class with the televisions. We want to have the same services in third class. We want improved comfort and greater security. The people are dissatisfied with their economic situation. That caused President Raja Paksa to be voted out at the last election. We're stopping in Rambukana. It's just a few minutes by tuk-tuk to Sri Lanka's biggest tourist attraction. The Pinawela Elephant Orphanage. The daily bath in the Maya Oya River is a sensation. Baby elephants and injured adults are nursed back to health here in Pinawela. This is Neela. Uh, one of our founder members. He's now about 60 years old. He was first brought into Pinnavala in 1975. So in 1975 was the inception of this organization. It started off with five baby elephants and he was brought in here as a baby. Now he's a very big one. And he has fathered about five babies for us. Uh, we have uh, his daughters and sons with us. Right now, we are housing about 77 elephants all together. There are four baby elephants making the tourists happy here at the moment. They are bottle fed six times a day, getting up to seven litres of milk. The animals are clearly happy. <laughs> some of them have been brought from the jungle, some of them have been born here. The sick elephants are kept separate. They have become sick because of certain accidents like train accidents and sometimes fights within the jungle. So we keep them here, treat them and give them a good life. We start ascending the plateau. An ox cart takes 12 days for this laborious journey. By train, it's around nine hours. Building the railway line took place under severe conditions. Many of the 3,000 workers died of malaria and cholera. Main line goes through very rough country. Uh, it goes through ravines and gorges and cuts, cutting cuttings and fillings and embankments and uh, tunneling. There are 42 tunnels from Colombo to Badulla. Uh, it was a real, real tedious work uh, uh, in the, at the time of construction and the labor was not cooperative and we had no mechanization no modern uh, no not, no kind of modern modernized uh, equipment for drilling uh, on laying the tracks all by human labor so it was difficult however 
the soil that proved so tiresome during the construction of the railway line harbors treasures too. There are lots of different gemstones in the ground. They adorn the crowns of monarchs and the jewelry of adored women. As a result, Sri Lanka has a long and lucrative tradition of goldsmithery. These days, it's mostly for tourists. That brings in good money. A goldsmith earns around 200 euros a month. Gems came into the limelight of human life because each and every gem carries a, a, a power to heal certain disease. This was medic medication at the beginning, even though now it has become a fashionable thing or an investment type thing. Sapphires in many different colors. The design is also made in Sri Lanka. We're about to reach Kandy. We've traveled 130 kilometers in three and a half hours. The climate is significantly more pleasant at 500 meters. Kandy was once the capital of the Singhalese kings and the epitome of Singhalese culture. The kings were able to defend their independence from the colonial powers for centuries here. The station was opened as far back as 1867. The blue water lily, Sri Lanka's national flower, is sold here. It's often used as a sacrificial gift at Buddhist temples. One of the most significant in the whole of Sri Lanka is Sri Dalada Maligawa, the temple of the sacred tooth. The most important Buddhist relic in Sri Lanka is kept here, the Buddha's upper left kuspid, a significant symbol of national pride. People come from all around the world to attend the daily services. They donate, and they pray. The 90-minute puja starts at half past nine. The word means something like worship and is an important ritual in everyday Buddhist life. According to legend, the sacred tooth is said to store the Buddha's spiritual strength. This belief also turned this religious relic into a political instrument of power for the Singhalese kings. Sri Lanka was ruled by kings. There were seven royal ruling periods. In 1815, the British conquered Kandy and with it the Temple of the Sacred Tooth as an important symbol of power in Sri Lanka. Patiently waiting outside the chamber where the relic is housed. Visitors only get to see a container the tooth isn't on display. It's said to be housed in an ivory capsule, which is in turn encased in six further containers. It's thanks to the temple that Kandy is on UNESCO's list of World Heritage Sites. There's a further spectacle worth watching, right next to the temple in the late afternoon. Acerodon eubatus bats, otherwise known as flying foxes, are getting comfortable. Okay. 
Kandy is also known for its dance performances. These men and women are just getting ready for one. The tradition dates back to the time of the last kings of Kandy. This dance troupe has performed since 1932. In the past, the dance was for the entertainment of the king. If the king was sick, the dance was used to cure him. We even had healing festivals. Today, the dances are mostly for the tourists. Waidi Yawati comes from a long line of dancers. The dancing tradition is passed on from generation to generation. The training is tough and starts every day at five in the morning. Performances take place all year round with very little time off. The performances consist of up to 11 different items. Balancing these discs is called the Raban dance. A performance lasts for about an hour. We've left Candy behind. The mountain landscape has some visual treats in store for us. Other treats await us on the train. Nileme sells small snacks in the carriages. He's done this for many years. It provides a living for his family. He has three children. I prepare the food at home and bring it to the train. I've been doing this for 20 years. Vade is a small snack. You take two or three pieces. I make a living doing this. My regulars like my pure Vade. That's why I always bring freshly baked goods. I have a permit and am allowed to sell it on the train. The passengers like it too. We're gradually getting used to the gentle rocking of the train. The women's colorful clothes strike us again and again. The main line snakes its way higher and higher up the plateau. The working population up here, mainly the women, are employed in the many textile companies. Their goods are Sri Lanka's most important industrial export. With wages at just 50 euros a month, manual labor is no luxury, and it's cheap compared to purchasing a loom. The women get to pick the colors. We tend to use strong, bright colors. In a day, you can weave a sarong that's around two meters long. The thread is spun on the spindle they've made themselves. The thin yarn of the sarong is very water absorbent. It's made of cotton and very pleasant on the skin. Silk is less practical. In the mountains, where it rains a lot, a cotton sarong is better.
We're apparently really lucky with the weather today. We're told on the train that there hasn't been a single day without rain up here in two and a half years. The British originally built the railway line to transport tea from the mountains to the port of Colombo. At first, tea was merely a substitute for coffee, which had been affected by a fungus, coffee rust. The British recruited Highland Tamils from southern India as cheap labour. To this day, tea is harvested on the unimaginably large area of 2,210 square kilometers, a safe job for many. We work on the plantations, picking tea leaves. We thank our president for that. It's good work. The income from the tea plantation made the former Ceylon the favourite colony of the British. In those days, the tea pickers only got rice as wages. Today, they get a bit more than three euros a day, working from sunrise to sunset. But that's not something they like to talk about. This is where the famous Ceylon tea comes from. We're in one of the countless tea factories, and we're proudly told what makes it special. A young, tender, softer leaf, maybe the better portion of the leaf. And the coarse stalks and the matured leaf can be the substandard material, where you have less chemical compounds. Where the young leaf is concerned, they have the better quality and the flavor by the way of chemical compound. The caffeine, amino acids, polyphenol, and some aromatics and essential oil are very rich when the leaf is young. A hundred people work in the Halper tea factory, which is around a hundred years old. After the tea leaves are dried, they're broken up by being rolled and shaken. After that, they're fermented and dried. The next step is to sort the tea by size. Sri Lanka is one of the world's biggest tea exporters. During the founding years, the construction of the railway line had to keep up with the opening of new tea plantations in the highlands. The railway has long since lost the significance it had in those days. The best time for the main line was uh, during the time of the British, when they were transporting the produce, when the tea is being produced over there. With the changeover to road transport, not a pound of tea is being transported by train today. These days, only around 1% of goods are transported by rail. Mr. Yonaka has made sure for the past 33 years that everything runs smoothly. I'm the senior conductor on the train during the whole trip, which makes me responsible for the lives of the passengers and for the railway property, for everything that happens on the way. A token is just being handed over. It's in this brass ring covered in leather. It ensures safety on this single track route and has done since 1901. 
When I pass on the token, the train driver has the permission to travel to the next station. I have to ring four times to get this token. And that's how they know at the next station that a train is coming. They ring four times in response and block their token. That unlocks my token. I can get it out and give it to the next train, which can then travel safely to the next station. <laughs> The token is unlocked and given to the train driver on the next train. Unfortunately, there are no longer any train tracks from Nanu Oya station to the famous hill station of Nuwara Elia. The writer Hermann Hesse of Steppenwolf fame had an enjoyable stay here in 1911. It's pleasantly fresh at a height of 1900 meters. The British called the small town Little England. And indeed, we can picture Miss Marple posting a letter here. Time seems to have stood still since 1876 in the time-honored Hill Club. In those days, the plantation owners relaxed here over a game of billiards. The laundry might be drying there today, but in those days, that's where the colonial rulers watched horse races. Everything was to be like a home away from home. It's rare for horse races to take place here these days. Things follow a slower pace on the racetracks these days. Another relic from the British period, Sri Lanka's most sophisticated golf club. Actually, this was started by the old British planters, and, uh, and they kept on uh, looking after it very well. Like uh, it, was the, it was not mainly for commercial activity, this was maintained like a me members club. Because, the, because it was maintained like a members club, it was not so commercially oriented, people start loving this place. So it's more than the tourists, it's actually the members who used to come to the pavilion and also to play golf. And so that's why the survival, I mean, I mean, and also the people around this place, they start loving this place. Visitors need temporary club membership to play the 18-hole course. The club has shaped the life of Sri Lanka's highest town for the past 125 years. Entire families used to live here. Even children were born on club premises. Many white gentlemen lived on the plantations back then. They came here to pass their time. When I was between 10 and 15, I worked for them as a caddy and was allowed to play too. That's how I started. In 1971, I became free golf champion of Sri Lanka. We're back at Nanu Oya station. We listen to the music of Clarence Vigavardhana, the Sri Lankan king of pop, now long dead. A change of vehicle. We participate in an inspection on a trolley. Of course, the token is a must on this trip, too. Maintaining the railway is quite elaborate work in Sri Lanka, particularly up here in the mountains. I generally help the senior railway staff in their monitoring work. 
The trolley is used for maintenance. And if there's been a derailment or a landslide, it takes railway staff to the scene. The heavy rainfall during the wet season causes a lot of damage to the track. Then it has to be fixed. We visit a British manor house at a slightly higher altitude. It houses a monastery these days, St. Benedict's. Father Michael has run it for 22 years. He runs the school for the novices and takes care of the property too. The fruit being chopped up here, ready to make jam, is called an elephant apple or wood apple. We started this jam industry for the maintenance of the house. In the beginning, we started with the marmalade and strawberry jam and guava jelly. So these three varieties we started in the beginning, but later we developed into different other items and still we are continuing what we started in the beginning. For almost 50 years now, a long-standing tradition. Lunch is being prepared at the same time. The fruits are also used as medicine before they ripen. 60-year-old Chandra is a master of his field. He has stirred and stirred and stirred ever since he was 13. If I take the jam off the fire at the right time, it will last for years. You can keep it for up to six years. There's a big demand for it. Despite the large quantity I make, there's nothing left over. It's the jam's consistency that determines the right time. Here too, everything's done by hand. Chandra produces up to a thousand jars every season. The train heads into the mountains on the main line twice a day. Unfortunately, the weather's becoming increasingly British. The total length of Sri Lanka's rail network is around 1,500 kilometers. The gauge is wider than the regular standard gauge. It's a broad gauge railway. Wow. Yeah, it is 1,676 millimeters in gauge, or 5 feet 6 inches in feet and inches. It is known as a broad gauge railway because the, the ideal situation for transport of good is the broadest gauge because they can bring more load. So they they had they laid the Britishers laid broad gauge here in Ceylon, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. It's ideal for transporting tea. The token is ready. The next station is Patti Paula. At 1,891 metres, it's Sri Lanka's highest station. Time has a different dimension up here. Um. 
The employees have to expect a number of difficulties up here. Roads can wash away. It can rain. Sometimes we have dew or frost in the mornings or animals get in the way of the train, such as the Sri Lankan tiger or wild boar or deer sambars. They can cause problems. We haven't seen any animals, and it's no surprise in this weather. But at last we reach the highlight of our trip, quite literally. They reached 1,881 meter height here at the railway summit here in Patipola, which is supposed to be a Guinness World of Records. It is given John Marshall's book of Guinness World of Records, Feats, uh, Facts and Feats of Railways. It is given at the highest point reached on a broad gauge railway. It's also quite inhospitable. We're 224 kilometers from Colombo now. The further away we are from the island's capital, the fewer passengers there are on the train. Towards the afternoon, our limbs become tired. We notice the altitude. We deserve a bit of relaxation. The region around Ella is known for its spa facilities. The hard-working tea pickers can only dream of visiting them. You have to bring some time with you when you come here. A relaxing Ayurveda massage takes 80 minutes. It's a special massage. All 107 vital spots are treated. That improves blood flow, which influences the organs. It gives you a lot of energy. The Indian art of healing has a long-standing tradition on Sri Lanka too. the holistic approach of Ayurveda and a calming view of nature. The steam bath with healing herbs is also good for relaxation. It reduces cholesterol levels, cuts weight and cleanses the skin. It's paradise. We are completely relaxed on our final leg to Ella. This stretch is definitely one of the most attractive in the whole of Asia. That's why it's best to think about its future. Main line should continue as a heritage railway, and it be by the it, it must be handed over to the UNESCO for conversion as a heritage railway, and then again as a tourist railway. I I never say I, I don't say that it should be stopped for the local passengers. Local passenger service should be maintained, but whereas for tourism they must develop this area further. A good idea because that would secure the continued existence of the main line, allowing travelers from all over to discover a new world in just nine hours.